Welcome to another episode of The Gayest Generation, where we hear LGBTQ older adults speak for themselves. Each episode, we sit down with a different member of the LGBTQ community who laid the foundation for the freedoms we have today. In today's episode, we speak with laughing woman Oshun Shenny, and boy do we laugh. We discuss queer spirituality, how to mend broken relationships, and the act of naming oneself. This is The Gayest Generation. Can I have you start with, hi, my name is? Hi, my name is Laughing Woman Ashano Shetty. And how old are you and how, and wh- how do you identify? I identify as lesbian, mm-hmm. female, um, she, she, she. <laughs> 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 and I just turned 68 a week ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, that's uh-huh. wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to be here with you today. Yeah, likewise. Um, where are you from and mm-hmm. kind of what was your world like? Yeah. Where you're from. Okay. So um, originally I'm from Akron, Ohio. I was born there and g- lived there till I was 16. And my dad's job transferred us up to Jackson, Michigan at that point. So I went to Parkside High School, um, graduated from there. And that's where I met my first love. Oh, my gosh. And uh, she and I, I was 17 and she had just turned 18. We were about four months apart in age. And we stayed together for 21 years. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, it was just kind of one of those things. Um, And we knew one other gay person in the school. Gordon went to school with us, too, and he had been out for a while, and Mm -hmm. he was was in my class. Um, So it was nice to have at least one gay person besides us there. Sure. Um, And uh, then I stayed in Jackson. Um, Oh, we lived there for about a year and a half after I graduated from high school. Um, and then moved up to Lansing. Mm -hmm. And what took us to Lansing was it was a bigger city. That's where there was a gay community. There was a community in Jackson, but it was all bar-oriented there. And that was a little not what we really wanted to be in for the rest of our lives. Yes, and that's something that I think is still around today in the community is some of the only spaces for us to go to are bars. Yeah. Sometimes you don't want to go to a bar. Sometimes you'd rather just... Just do something. Yeah. 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 Like have a restaurant you could go to. Yes. 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 Um, But to back up a little bit here, when we first met over the phone, you had described yourself, and let me get the quote right, Uh as a in-your-face tomboy warrior. What does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) I had to get it right. I had to look down. I said, in your face, tomboy warrior. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, I developed into that. You know, as a a kid, I was really kind of shy. But when I got into my teens, yeah, the Vietnam War was going on. It was, we lived about 30 miles from Kent State University when, when the National Guard shooting of the students happened out there. There were a lot of things to be angry about. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I got angry, as yeah. well as being in puberty. <laughs> sure. I got angry. Um, and and um, because of some family dynamics and stuff, I just really learned how to stand up for myself. Mm. And so I was just one of these people who, you ask me a question, I'll tell you the truth. You don't like the truth? Tough shit. Yep. <laughs> you know, really. <laughs> and what a wonderful lesson to learn earlier in life. Yes. I, th- I, I know a few folks who are uh, in our... Uh, adulthood we're still kind of wrestling with that yeah so it's really cool to kind of have yeah. that edge oh it was it yeah. was and being closeted made absolutely no sense to me sure you know it was it was pretty well mandated to hold a job yep um and uh, so i started holding jobs outside of jackson because in jackson i was too well known and my family was too well known and stuff but but um I, I, it just felt schizophrenic to me to be in the closet. Mm. And Rosie and I were some of the few in the community who weren't closeted in Jackson. Um, and we were also some of the youngest in the out community at that point. Um, and that, that made a big difference, too, because all the, all the, the previous generation from us, um, <clears throat> really for their own survival, had to stay closeted. And what did the world look like for queer people at that time? <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was um, it was hard to find community until you found community. Mm. When, once you, f- you got your foot in the door, there were a lot of people. Um, it was aggressively not nice, um, the, the world outside of the gay community toward us. 
Um, it was not safe to like walk down a street and hold hands with each other. Mm -hmm. It was not safe to have any public displays of affection. Um, and sometimes even in the bars, it wasn't safe because the police had come in. They'd raid the bars. And, and the bar in Jackson, Bill and Joe's bar there, um, always had somebody on the lookout outside the door. And if the police came or somebody came who it just looked didn't belong there, there was a signal. And, yes. you know, we everybody inside just kind of sat down in their seats or played pool or quit holding hands, you know, didn't touch each other, stuff like that. It was it was a, a surreal world. And uh, this bar you mentioned, what was it called again? Bill and Joe's. Bill and Joe's. And was yeah. it ran by a Bill and a Joe? It was originally run by a Bill and a Joe. Um, <laughs> Bill man, Joe woman, ma husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And by the time we were going to it, um, it, it was only Joe. Bill had died. And and the clientele was almost exclusively gay and lesbian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I, uh, if I remember this incorrectly, please tell me. Mm -hmm. But you described a time where y you and your friends would go there and to pay for the food and drinks, you would do the dishes or you would do um, a little bit of. Rosie and I did that. We, yeah. we waited tables in exchange for our drinks there. Uh. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we we were just starting out in our jobs and stuff like that and could just barely afford rent and, and a car and food and stuff. So instead of spending all that money on, on alcohol, which, of course, had to be drunk at that point, you know. Oh, certainly. Who else was um, going to do it? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they had it there. Um, <laughs> and and that, got, that got me in a little trouble sometimes. I, I liked it a little too much sometimes. Sure. But, um, but as long as we were waiting tables, we'd go in and we'd wait tables to shift. And then the next night we could go in and we could drink. Ah, yeah. They need to bring that system back. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I think actually it was not legal. <laughs> but, I, you know, we were legal age, but I don't think the system was legal. <laughs> sure. um, it's something that I think that my generation and generations um, younger than me have taken for granted. We grew up in a time where you could flick on the television and see an episode of a, of a show and you would have some grasp on what being gay was whether that's a negative or a positive thing yeah but that information was obtainable mm -hmm. through doing this podcast i've understood that that's uh, not the case yes that's true how did you learn or how did you come to know this thing that is gay yeah you know? yeah well um i remember when i was in seventh grade i read the book the valley of the dolls and there was oh. there was mention in there of lesbians. Oh um, yes, there was. Yes, and, and it gay was, husbands. Yes, and it was all kind of seedy and partyish and that kind of stuff. Um, I love that book <laughs> yes. so much. And, and my mother thought I was way too young to be reading that book. Yes. I couldn't possibly understand it. I kept saying, "Oh, but I do." <laughs> um, but I was. But I didn't. I didn't identify as lesbian at that mm -hmm. time. I had no clue. I wasn't even sexual at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I remember watching a movie. Um, that made this very brief mention to a lesbian. It was a movie about a women in a, in a mental institution mm -hmm. and this very brief mention of the lesbian. She was seen as an aggressor who violated other women in the institution. So that's what I thought a lesbian was. Mm -hmm. Either, you know, drunken partier or a, a crazy woman in an institution who attacked other women. And, um, and then I was aware of the Stonewall riot Ooh. when that happened. I remember that. Um, and I remember seeing, you know, just a brief news thing about it. Uh, they didn't broadcast much, but it was on the national news the night that it happened or the day after. And so I remember watching that. So I was aware of that. That was it. And when Rosie and I met each other, we had no clue what to call ourselves. So we we call we called we called our our thing with each other the it yeah. it wow. you know <laughs> what are we going to do about it <laughs> <laughs> we're having fun doing it <laughs> I like it <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, yeah yeah and um, eventually we did come across uh, Radcliffe Hall's Well of Loneliness oh my and that gosh, yes, that yes. was. After we were out of high school and were living together, there was one bookstore in Jackson that actually had that book there. And we read that. And that was kind of a classic. I mean, yeah. it had been around since the 20s or 30s or something like that. Um, but, but again, that was kind of a sad story. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a degraded story or anything like mm -hmm. that. It was a love story between two women. But it was love in a time when it was absolutely forbidden. So it was a hard, sad thing to read. 
Mm -hmm. you know? And this is not the first time that the well of loneliness has appeared on a podcast episode, mm -hmm. which just reinforces how much uh, I really got to get my hands on a copy and, and, and read it. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I've learned how important it has been for people. Oh yeah. Um, so this is around 17 when you and Rosie are falling in love. Yes. And trying to figure out what it is. How are your friends and family reacting to that? Oh, we were very quiet. Yeah. We were very quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only the only reaction that came was, um, you know, we'd probably been dating each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't call it that, but for a few months. And um, there was a sleepover at a friend's of mine house. And Rosie and I slept in the same bed together. Mm -hmm. And the friend's mother called my parents and let them know that. <sighs> Yes. And so my parents blew. They, they, they sent my brothers away for the day. Um, they confined me to the house and wouldn't let me make any phone calls or anything and just grilled me. And they were going to commit me to a mental institution. Mm -hmm. I was 17 and a half by then, wow. which was a legal age for emancipation. And I told them that I would do that, that I'd emancipate myself if they tried. Um, and backed them down, but we, they grilled me for hours. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember for sure how I did it, but I managed to get, <clears throat> this was a Saturday, I managed to get a note put on Rosie's car door at church Sunday morning, which was just a couple blocks from our house, warning her what had happened and that they were planning on calling her and inviting her to come over that afternoon to see whether she collaborated my story. And what I had done by the end of the day, I told him I was lying to him. I was known as a liar in the family anyway. So I just told him I was just lying to get a rise out of you and see what you, you know, see how you'd re respond to that. And so they did call Rosie over. And by that time she knew what had happened and so, you know, she she backed me up. She's like I have no idea where she got that idea, you know, <laughs> that uh. kind of thing. <laughs> and, and one of the funniest things for me, I, you know, this is, it's not the kindest thing to say about my mother, but one of the funniest things for me was that they so badly wanted to believe that I was not lesbian, that after Rosie collaborated the story, that we weren't, three days later, I asked if Rosie could come spend the night Friday night. My mother let her. Yeah. And again and again and again. And I just, you know, for the rest of my, my time of living at home, which wasn't much longer. I mean, I was going into my senior year of high school when this happened. Um, and I, we moved out shortly after I graduated from high school. Rosie and I moved into our own place. But, but I, just, I used to just laugh about that. I never did tell my mother. <laughs> I came out to her, at, you know, after I safely had my own apartment. I came uh -huh. out to her for real. But I, I never did tell her how amusing I thought it was that she was so willing to believe the lie that she actually facilitated us sleeping together for close to a year. Yes, mm -hmm. there is a phenomenon that is the Midwestern silence. Yes. And that silence allows people, I'm going to believe what I want to believe. And although you were grilled over the course of a day about it, when it was done, it sounds like it was kind of done for that moment. Yeah, it was kind of done for that moment. And yeah. back to normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're back to normal, which is... Mm -hmm almost superhuman um, levels of denial. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I've, uh, sp speaking with other people, it's it's this Midwestern silence thing that so fascinates me and yeah. and, and, and how it relates to queerness. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, after graduating high school, you moved to Lansing. Yeah, we lived in Jackson for about a year and a half after that. Um, and then... Rosie got a job up in Lansing. We'd been looking, trying to find places to, to go. But we, we had started going up to Lansing. There was a lesbian center, lesbian community center in Lansing at the wow. time. The only one in the country. Sure. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard about the newsletter, Lesbian Connection. It's an international lesbian newsletter. That's the group that started it. And I did not know that. Yes, yes. And it was originally, it was published at the Lesbian Center there. It still is, but, the, but it's in a different building than it used to be. Um, but there were dances up there every mm. now and again. And we had some friends in Lansing who knew about them. And so Nancy and Judy introduced us to the Lesbian Center. And then we were like, okay, th this is the town we need to move to now. Just let's just get jobs. And, and so Rosie got a job up there and I followed. And so we made our move. <laughs> and what was the center called? Uh, 
the Lansing Lesbian Center. The Lan- well, what else? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Lansing yeah. Lesbian that, Center. And, and from that group of women is where the Michigan Miss, uh, Women's Music Festival got started. Mm. I mean, these were bold, in-your-face lesbians at the time. And this would have been like in um, probably 1976. Okay. And, um, and most of them were associated with Michigan State University somehow mm-hmm. or another. And mm-hmm. I also remember from our previous conversation that's something that you did, and along with Rosie, I'm not sure, but you were invited into MSU classrooms and MSU spaces, uh, if I remember correctly, yes. just to speak with sports teams. Uh, to speak with any any class, any group that that whose teacher or or the staff person that was working with them mm-hmm. wanted to, um, and it wasn't with Rosie. She she had to protect herself professionally sure. a little bit, um, which was better. <laughs> she made the she made the best money between the two of us, <laughs> um, and um, um, but. I signed up with a gay and lesbian uh, student group at, at mm-hmm. M- Michigan State. I went to some classes there for a while um, to be a speaker. And so, you know, they'd get a teacher, a prof would want somebody to come into a classroom or a coach would want somebody to come and they'd just put out the word and we'd go. And I also did the same thing at Western Michigan after I moved to Kalamazoo, Western Michigan University. Yeah. And I'm sure you got some stories coming into these spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, did you receive any pushback? Oh, yes. Or did you stumble into some surprising moments of um, acceptance or actualization? Or I'd have to say both. Yeah. I'd have to say both. I, one of them that really stands out for me mm-hmm. up at, at Michigan State was um, I was speaking to a large class. Like there were maybe 60 or 70 people in the class in a lecture hall. And, and there were two other people on the panel with me on the speaker's panel. And the front row seats were the football players. Oh, yeah. And they were there proving their masculinity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And and there was there were comments and there were heckles and things like that. And um, my way of handling that when I spoke to it was, I can get better than you from a doorknob. Yeah. Ooh, and ooh, <laughs> 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and you know and there were some some people in the class who had religious objections to us and and you know that we had we had agreed those on the panel um, had agreed ahead of time how we'd respond to those things because we were expecting them and so you know we just didn't entertain religious conversation yep it was just like you know well you're welcome to your beliefs mm-hmm. and we'd move right on ah uh, yeah um and when you came into these spaces was it like uh, were you giving a presentation or was it more like Ask a lesbian. It was more like ask a lesbian. <laughs> ask a gay guy. <laughs> I, okay. I, at first, I'm like, okay, that's scary. But I also love that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the prof or who you know whatever staff person was in charge would introduce us mm-hmm. and who we were, what we were about, and um, you know, and then we like say a little something. I can't even remember what I said. It was so minute at that point. But then we just opened the floor to questions. Yeah. Yeah. And and some people were just had really naive questions. Um, some people would thank us for being there. I had people come up after some of the presentations sometimes and just very quietly say, thank you. I'm gay too. Yes. You know, yeah, just there was a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Um. So my mom used to be the president of a local chapter of P-Flag. Yes. Back where I'm from. Yeah. And she would go into spaces. She would be invited to go to like a uh, like a middle school or a high school info fair. Yes. And she always would say, you know, this was really difficult. I didn't really talk to anybody or the people I did talk to were kind of mean to me. But I always think about there's got to be somebody out there who said nothing to me. Yes. Who just saw me. Yes. And that meant something. Yes. And that makes me think about your experiences in these spaces because there's people who didn't say a word and you would perhaps would never notice. Right. But because you were there. Yes. And there were people there who we did notice. Yeah. We just didn't connect with them. We oh. just, you know, it's like, I see you up there. I yeah. See you. Yeah. But they were being quiet and we didn't want to out them. And and that was kind of there was a code of silence in the community too at that point. You did not out somebody. You just never did it. And um, quite often we didn't even know each other's last names. Mm. We might be friends for years and never have heard each other's last names because that silence about outing people was so strong. Mm. Mm-hmm. In in that culture of 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 silence, 
here you are as a group going into these faces and, and being the the very opposite of. That's right. <laughs> what kind of conversations did you have amongst your group to prepare you for those conversations? Or really, what, how do I make this question make sense? Uh, what is it about you and y'all that made that possible? Um, I would say that we were people who were bound and determined we were going to be recognized as the human beings we are. Mm. And, you know, we were all gay rights activists. Yes. All of us. Um, and a lot of, you know, the women were almost all feminist activists also. Um, and mm. we just, we were just living out loud. Uh, we were not going to be shut down. This intersection of gay rights and feminism, mm -hmm. which I think is so important, um, you had mentioned previously that it wasn't until you had moved to Lansing that you came out to your family. No, I came out to my family when we lived in Jackson. When you lived in Jackson. Yeah, it was as soon as, like, Rosie and I had been in an apartment for about six months mm -hmm. when I came out to my family. It was just as soon as I knew I wasn't going to have to move back to my parents' house. <laughs> I see. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Yeah. My mom and dad never got over it. Mm -hmm. My mom particularly. My dad... My dad softened a lot. Um, my brothers were fine. Yeah. I, my youngest brother was only eight when Rosie and I met each other. So he, he basically grew up yeah. with a sister-in-law yep. and w has always been really comfortable. My middle brother, he and I are just really close and, and he's very Christian, um, but he, he deals with me. He's, you know, he's very comfortable with me. He's very comfortable in my home. He's very comfortable around Suzanne, my wife, and and was around Rosie. You know, and and um, and my older brother was away at at college in Montana at the time that I came out to the family. But I came out to him, and he's a little bit more conservative. But even he is just, hey, sis, you know, you're who you are. You're my sister. Yes. And and so I'd have to say that the. the primary challenge in my family was with my mother and it was all because of her religious beliefs i see and you know and there are folks like your middle brother it sounds like who are able to hold these two different ideas of mm -hmm. like here's my faith that says certain stuff mm -hmm. and here's what i know about my sister yes and i can hold both of these things that's right and i think some people uh it's easier yeah for some people than for other people uh, you said something that, that sparked a question in my head. You said, over time, your dad softened. Yes. What is that process like? Well, it was like he wouldn't talk about it at all at first, you know, right after I came out. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, and, and that was my dad. You know, he just, he processed his emotions himself. Um, and then, but, but during that whole time, he was always very welcoming to Rosie mm -hmm. because I brought her. And, you know, that's just what you do. Yes. Yeah. And then he got to the point, um, I'd say it was probably six or seven years after I came out to the family, after I came out to my folks, that my dad got to the point where he'd start asking me questions mm. and just, you know, you and Rosie doing okay? You happy? You know, stuff like that, just very gently testing the waters. And um, then years later, um, my mom would travel out to Oregon several times a year to visit her her parents and siblings. Okay. That's where her family had moved to. And um, so dad would be home. And he would start he started calling me up on Saturdays or Sundays when he wasn't working. And, hey, sis, let's go get lunch together. Yeah. And we started having these wonderful, just in-depth conversations. And eventually it evolved to the point where um, after Rosie and I split up and I was single for a couple of years... He and I were sitting talking one night, late at night after my mom went to bed. <laughs> he made sure she was sound asleep. And he says, well, you know, I'm concerned about you because I know you're, you're seeing people, you're dating people. I said, yeah. He says, well, what are you doing about AIDS? Oof. And, and Oof. yeah, and I said, well, Dad, for lesbians, that's not a real issue. I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm careful. I only, if I have sex, I have sex with women who only have sex with women. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, but so, so for me, it's really very safe. And I'm very careful about who I do anything like that with. And I don't do it often at this point. Yeah. You know, and he, he was like, oh, I, I, I didn't realize that. And I said, yeah, it's because of the difference in the way that, that two women make love with each other. And that led into a conversation about how two women make love with each other. He wanted to know. 
Oh my God! And it wasn't it wasn't like a voyeur thing. He just wanted to know. It was like so. How does that happen? Yes, yeah. yes. And and um, after I explained it to him, he says, "I can certainly see why you enjoy that." <laughs> and I was sitting there, and I'm like, "Going, is this my dad? Yes, yeah. this, this is my dad." <laughs> oh my gosh. That is major. Yes. Um. That makes me think, uh, uh, I think a challenge that we face as a community is that people uh, are afraid of what they don't know. Yeah. So there's this thing, he he learns about AIDS, he doesn't really know much about it, but there's fear. And he knows it's in the gay community. And he he knows, and that's, oh, ah, and... um, <laughs> he knows that lesbians have sex together, but what the hell does that even? Yeah, there's this there's this thing about the unknown. I, I, I'm I'm not getting my words right, but um, that is an amazing story. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it about your your dad's personality that kind of allows him to ask questions like that? Is he a, a certain kind of person, or what's the? Um, I'd say he's curious. Yes, he he, he was curious. They're, they've both passed now. Um, but also professionally, he had to ask people questions in his what profession. Did he, do? Uh, he was a CPA. Oh, okay. And so you know he had to dive in with people sometimes, not about their their intimate world, <laughs> but you know for some Is people there a tax for break some for people that? their finances are their intimate world. You know? Very much so. <laughs> but but he was accustomed to just asking straightforward questions yeah. because he needed straightforward answers from mm-hmm. people, and so he did. And and he and I had the kind of rapport where I asked him straightforward questions about a lot of things and, you know, and, and, um, and he knew that I spoke my mind, that I yep. would speak my truth. And so I, it just, I, it was just one of this, one of the, a part of our relationship that was never there as in my childhood, because my parents stayed mom and dad. There, there was no, okay. you're going to know us as a human being. <laughs> my, my dad and I always could talk better in, during the trouble years with, with my mom and I. My dad and I could always talk better than I could talk to my mom. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he'd listen to me instead of just getting angry at me. Yes. And then he'd reason with me instead of yelling at me and that ah. kind of thing. Yeah. So, so we had that history, but I didn't really know him as a person until I got into my late 20s and 30s and then much better when I was in my 40s. Um, but, but it just, you know, he just wanted to know, he asked if I, if I didn't want to answer, I'm sure he would have just gone, okay, sure. you know, yeah. Communication. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, what was the communication like between you and your mother at that time? Did you being lesbian affect different facets of your relationship? It affected a lot of our relationship. Um, But one of the things, uh, a couple of the things my mom and I had in in common was, first of all, family came first for Mm -hmm. both of us, always. Um, Not not from the perspective that I'm going to beat myself down to make my family happy. But family is high priority, and you you stay loyal to the family. Um, And we were both avid gardeners. We're both very creative, uh-huh. and um, so I kind of steered our relationship toward gardening, you know, and we'd, we'd do things like that together. Um, I'd help her in her gardens, and sometimes she'd come to my house and help me in mine, and we'd talk about our sewing projects, and my, I, I, I quilt, and my mom didn't quilt, but she was an amazing tailor, mm-hmm. and so she was always curious about my quilts, and I was always just awed at the fact that she could like make men's suits (laughs) (laughs) that is incredible it is yeah yeah yeah. and she never that wasn't her profession but you know but she just loved doing it um and we both have an artistic streak to us Mm -hmm. and you know so we we connected over those kinds of things and um i always 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 regardless of what was going on between my mom and i when i saw her i hugged her i kissed her and i told her i love her and Mm -hmm. and she did the same with me you know and I mean, it was just like, this is where we really live with each other. Yeah. And even if we can only do it for 30 seconds, this is us. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I always repeat myself on the podcast, but that is really incredible. Um, you had said that 
the way that you were able to communicate with your father changed over your 20s, 30s, 40s, into your 50s. It all changed. It was always in a state of flux. Yeah. What did that journey look like with your mother? Um, I would say that was also always in a state of flux. Mm -hmm. um, we both were pretty creative in the ways we tried to communicate with each other. It, it wasn't always successful mm -hmm. at all. Um, I did not allow her to be mom uh. to me, f you know, after I moved out of the house, um, which I think was hurt her a lot mm. um, because she kept trying, you know. She, she didn't quite know how to give that up. And and there were places where I I did, like for a moment, I needed mom. And, and I'd let her show up. But as soon as the moment passed, we were back to the stalemate. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got into my mid-30s, I guess it was, I had done enough growth myself, emotional growth and healing of my own emotional wounds from my childhood and stuff like that, that I'd learned a lot of really good communication skills. Mm -hmm. And most of that came from being in the lesbian community. From, you know, I mean, I was interacting with women my mom's age all the time. Sure. And learning wow. how, okay. you know. And, um, um, and then, and I also had, was starting on my path as a healer. And so I was learning new ways of communicating there. And I finally got to the point where I actually knew how to have a really emotionally charged conversation very calmly, mm. very lovingly, and very open heartedly. And that's when I initiated the change between my mom and I. <laughs> and for people listening, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Just well, for the people listening, not me. Yeah. yeah. Other people. <laughs> well, well, first of all, how I do that mm -hmm. is I'm the still point in the conversation. I set the tone. Mm -hmm. And I initiate the conversation, typically. Like with my mom, I took her a rose quartz beaded necklace and I gave it to her and I just said, I just want you to know that the fight is over. Mm. I love you and I have missed you. And I took her in, in private, we were at their house. Mm -hmm. I took her to a, a room upstairs where nobody could hear our conversation at all to do that. And she burst into tears and so did I and we hugged each other and we were both like, I have missed you so much. I just want to know you. <laughs> And we, uh. sat, we sat there and talked for 45 minutes with each other. And then um, I took the initiative again. I, I initiated that, but I took the next step in the initiative and invited her to lunch with me one day. Just come meet me for, for lunch, Mom. Let's just do that. That's a girl thing we've never gotten to do with each other. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And then that got reciprocal. She, you know, we kept going back and forth with that. Mm -hmm. And gradually, we started having more heart-to-heart -heart conversations with each other, phone conversations, in-person conversations. And seriously, by the time I was probably, I guess I'd have to say by the time I was 41 or 42, I would say my mom and I were back to being really good friends. And by the time I was 50, I'd have to say we were best friends uh. again. And, you know, the relationship just kept growing and she kept growing with it. And it's not that she laid down the objection to me being lesbian. Yeah. I, you know, six months before she died, she was telling somebody, my wife is my friend. And when I said, no, she's my wife, she said, no, she's not. She's your friend. You know, <laughs> I was like, well, she's my friend like dad's your friend. Yeah. You know, <laughs> she's a friend. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, so that, that, that was always there. But I stopped, I stopped bringing any drama to it. Yep. I just, you know, if she wanted to get dramatic about it. That was all on her. Yes. I just, I just held steady. I, like I said, I was the still point. Mm -hmm. I just, I set the tone for myself, and I kept it. And it sounds like you, you knew where you were coming from, and you liked yourself enough to not. Oh, I didn't just like myself. I, I love, love myself. Oh, <laughs> the big L O B. -E. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you loved yourself enough to be like. Uh, and please correct me if this is wrong, but uh -huh. if you're coming into this space where you might get some confrontation, you're like, I am the, uh, I, I love myself to be okay with with the idea of such a confrontation occurring. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ooh. Yes. What was that path yes. to self love like? Um, tumultuous. I was very dramatic. Sure. Um, uh, I you gotta I, be. Yeah. I did a lot of drinking for a few years. Mm -hmm. Ended up in AA for a few years, <sighs> um, but also was was. Learning to be spiritual outside of Christianity. 
And that for me was a lifesaver. Um, up at the Michigan Women's Music Festival, yes. I got to to interact with a lot of women who were into women's spirituality, and um, I got it. I just I just got how to be an incredibly powerful self generated female on it this clicked. planet. It clicked for me. And and Michigan Festival was a lot of it. The lesbian community in Lansing and in Kalamazoo was a lot of it too. There were some powerful women in those places and wow. and women who absolutely were not going to be hemmed in by social norms. Ugh. And I I was one of them, but I didn't recognize myself when I first started into it. I was just mad. You yeah. know, how dare you tell me I can't call it color blue when I want to color blue. Yeah. You know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um and so so, you know, part of it was just getting a little bit older, but, but a huge part of it was being around these women who just gave me this amazing example of what it is to stand your ground as a woman. And to backtrack just a little bit here, you said the um, Michigan Women's Festival came from the lesbian connection. It started with the, the ambitious Amazons, who were the group that, that ran the Lesbian Center in Lansing and who started... Um, the the uh, Lesbian Connection newsletter. And what what might one find in a copy of the Lesbian Connection? It's like a networking newsletter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still it's still there. They're celebrating their fiftieth anniversary this coming fall. And Shout it's, out to them. Yeah, and it's it's all volunteer. Well, there's paid staff now, mm-hmm. um, but it's all just contributions from readers and um, some some ads from from readers and different things like that. International. Um, and, and That's so cool. Yeah, and it's and it's like everybody's just talking on a topic. They they publicate they publicize the topics for the upcoming issues. Mm-hmm. Comes out. It's it's either four times or six times a year. I can't remember right now. I I still get it. Sure. Um, and and it, you know so they they give you the topics ahead of time, and anybody who wants to write in on them writes in about them, and so you get this just wonderful array of perspectives of women of a lot of different ages from a lot of different cultures and you know it's just like kind of sitting down having a chat with a bunch of friends uh, so they would they would send out you know the may the may topic's going to be x y and z yeah and folks would write right in about it oh uh, yeah yeah i wish there was an analog for the community today, and although you, it's still going strong. It's still going strong. They're starting to really reach out to attract younger lesbian readers. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the readership is like, you know, 40 and over mm-hmm. at this point. Um, but they're starting to get a lot more participation from younger women, and and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. There's a, there's a big, I'd have to say there's a big focus in the lesbian community on being intergenerational. And making sure that that you know the the power gets passed on to the next generation, that the the skills that those of us who have been living a long time have gathered um, are shared openly and, and easily in the community. Gay men, did you hear that? Yeah, guys, we can start acting like that. Yeah, guys, bring it together. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of this podcast is kind of building that thing that you uh, just described. Yeah. And it's uh, very empowering to hear how it exists. Um, in the wild, if you will. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing about how that's not how gay men exist at all. Um, the older generation, <laughs> please pass along your wisdom and uh, be nicer. <laughs> 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 but okay, so am, um, ambitious Amazons or mm-hmm. lesbian connection newsletter, lesbian connection newsletter to. Michigan Women's Festival. Yeah, Michigan Women's Festival and Lesbian Connection Newsletter are separate from each other, but they, it, it just, there was this really wonderful group of, of women in the Lansing community and, you know, outs, outskirts too, mm-hmm. Grand Rapids, Detroit, Ann Arbor, you know, who came together as a result of this stuff that was going on in, in Lansing. And um, there were two women, I do not recall their names now, uh, Vogel. Lisa Vogel and her sister, Mm -hmm. um, who founded the festival. And originally it was on just, you know, in somebody's pasture up in northwestern Michigan. Um, And then eventually uh, the festival had had brought in enough money and stuff like that that they bought, I think it's a 700-acre parcel. 
<sighs> which since festival ended several years ago, it, it it was there for 40 years, and then it, it came to a close. Um, that's been bought by a, a collective of women, mm -hmm. and it's being held in trust. And the way they say it is for women and girls forever. Uh. Yeah, they've made it into a land trust, and there's there's still events that go on up mm -hmm. there. But the big, the great big Michigan Women's Music Festival ceased to be several years ago. So one would uh, go for community to meet other lesbians and to meet, be with other women. Mm -hmm. um, they would go for the music. Oh, yeah, yeah. What other sorts of things? Um... Mishfest went on for, for, for um, attendees. It went on for a week. Mm -hmm. um, for workers, they were up there for sometimes two to three months, up there for a month or two setting up everything ahead of time, and then for a week or two, tearing down everything afterwards. Okay. Um, the land was taken back to its natural state after every festival. So it was just a once a year thing. And um, so the music was a big draw. Um, there, were, there was a wonderful, wonderful craftswomen's market. Just absolutely wonderful women from all over the world. Um, there were workshops going on from like breakfast till dinner time every single day. Some of the topics being? Some of the topics being... Um, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> they covered yeah. the gamut. Spirituality, uh, religion, you know, the, the Jewish women, the Christian women, the Mormon women um, got together and had their own services up there. Um, there were workshops for, uh, for minority, minority women, you know, mm -hmm. within the minorities, within the lesbian community, for Native women, for Black women, for Hispanic women, Latinx women. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, uh, there was crafts workshops. There were workshops about sexuality in its various forms. Yeah. Um, um, uh, ritual workshops. There were rituals that went on constantly up there. There was always at least one big one at the night stage during the course of the festival. But during the daytime, there were a lot of rituals in the workshops. And there, were, there was like musicians there teaching their skills, teaching the craft. Um, and there were craftswomen there teaching the craft in these uh, workshops that were all free. You just go to them. Too cool. They were held out in a meadow, mm -hmm. and you just go. And what did the social, like, there's these workshops and, and music you're attending, but it also serves a social function. Absolutely, yeah. There were also volleyball games. Yeah. Um, there, were, there were drumming circles. There were dances every night. Um, there was a huge dining area where we all got together. There was a community center where, you know, if you wanted to just go sit inside and read a book for a while, you could do it or connect mm. with somebody. Um, uh, there was a health care tent. There was, I, I mean, it was just, there were so many ways. And everybody who attended was expected to work at least one four-hour work shift during the week. I did not know that. Yes, yes. And so that was a way of getting to know people, too. You know, if you worked in the kitchen, you're, you're cooking with... 50 other women if you you know if you worked in help cl helping the crafts women get their stuff to the t to their t uh, booths you were working with other women um and there was just socializing there were parades there <laughs> there, <yeah. laughs> there was one workshop i went to one time was the chocolate women yeah. and and what we did was we just covered each other with chocolate and then we all went and took a shower together <laughs> you know? <laughs> it just <laughs> we did all kinds of fun things and, yes. and there was there was a there was a camping area for girls it was mm -hmm. called Gaius Girls Camp and the girls always did their own parade you know for they came right through through the center the main street of festival doing their own parade and i you know it was just we had fun we had uh, a lot of fun together it sounds like a total who yes it was um and i understand that it is here um, where you first started exploring spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, well, there were, there were women who came to the festival that were really strong spiritual leaders in, mm -hmm. in the women's spirituality movement, like Starhawk came and, and Z Budapest was there, and Amelie, who was an Iroquois medicine woman, she came, and they taught um, in addition to doing some other things. So, so that kind of stuff was available. But there was also, you know, local women, women from Ann Arbor, women from Detroit, women, women who came from L.A., stuff mm. like that, just ordinary women who were priestesses who just knew how to lead rituals. And, um, and so for me, the, the immersion in uh, a woman-centric perspective on spirit was just 
breathtaking. Mm -hmm. I I grew up in a, a, I wouldn't say like evangelical Christian by any mean, but a conservative Christian community. Um, And um, um, so everything was about God the Father and Jesus the Son and, you know, and, and women were expected to participate in church, but you don't preach, you don't lead the singing, you don't, you know, da 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 da. And mm-hmm. and that was just really stifling for me. Um, even as a child, I bucked against that some. Um, and so being in this place where spirit was celebrated by like these big lavish altars with sarongs and flowers all over them that were pretty Fabulous. to look at, and and you danced in big circles and you hooped and hollered and shouted and wolf whistled and <laughs> you know just <laughs> and it was just it was just such a freeing experience of being fully human and connecting with hum- with spirit instead of having to set aside my humanity or forgive my humanity. Oh, forgive my humanity. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I am somebody who is not familiar with the world of spiritualism. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what would be like a general definition or what would be like a kind of, you know, if I flipped open a dictionary, what would it say? Uh, well, <laughs> it wouldn't be that easy. Sure. You know, okay. um, um, I, I identify as a, a shaman. That's, mm-hmm. that's part of the work I do and, and pagan. Mm -hmm. And um, my definition of paganism is that we are agreed upon anarchy. (laughs) Every pagan does it different. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't happen to tend to gods or goddesses. A lot of pagan people do. A lot of shamanic people do. Um, I I certainly know that there's a force greater than myself out there. And I don't care how it's defined. It doesn't matter to me. Um, So... um, I guess I would just say it's being present to that greater reality that includes us, all other living beings on this planet, the planet herself being mm-hmm. a living being, all the universe being a living being, all the souls who've gone before, all the souls who haven't come in yet. And mm-hmm. just being present to that world in whatever ways work um, for you as an individual. Uh, sounds pretty cool to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's for me. It's the only way I can do spirituality. Mm-hmm. Um, it's if somebody starts putting rules in there, I'm just like, uh, uh-uh. uh. Don't tell me I have to remember the rules. <laughs> I barely color within the lines. Just yeah. <laughs> 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 don't hem me in. <laughs> uh, don't hem me in. I, yeah. I think that's kind of a a theme. Uh, kind of. Yes. Um, what sort of work do you do as a shaman? I work one-on-one with individuals. I do mm-hmm. some teaching also. I've written several books also that, that share my skills. That's a big thing for me, getting these out there in the world to people. Heck yeah. Um, and um, I, guess I, I guess the best way I'd have to describe my work is I help people become fully empowered human beings. True. Yeah, yeah. And my goal anytime I'm working with somebody is to work myself out of a job. Mm-hmm. I want them to be so strong in themselves that nothing will blow them over again. Mm. And they don't need anybody's advice to stay in their, their own wisdom. Oh, I can imagine that is very difficult work, but very um, rewarding work. It is, it is. Um, and I'd say it's not, for me, it's not really difficult. It's where I thrive. Ah. It's, it's just me expressing the fullness of my own nature. Yes. Um, certainly I've learned skills through the years from other mm-hmm. people and stuff. Um, but everything I've learned, I've adapted to, okay, I get it. I got the concept. Yep. This is how I do it. Um, this, this is what I can remember to do. So I'm doing it my way. <laughs> 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 and and um, um, I work with people all over the world. Mm-hmm. Used to work with people in person. I don't, I, I don't do that at this point in my life. It's, mm-hmm. it's just not conducive to what's going on in my home at this point. Um, but I, I have clients all over the world still. That, that just call me for sessions from time to time. And I love talking to them. I've met some of the most amazing people, no matter how confused they get in some moments. They, they are just incredible human beings. Oh, I can only imagine. Mm-hmm. Is there, without kind of putting them out there like that, is there a, a particular anecdote or story or experience in your work that stands out to you? or? I, I guess... Um, because I hold ki- client confidentiality yes. really strongly, I guess what I would have to say is how my work impacts me. Sure. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. I learn every time I work with a client. I'm like, 
oh, I never thought of that before. <laughs> and I, I used to call that learning by, by osmosis, mm-hmm. that I'd, I'd say it and I'd go, oh, I'm going to have to think on that a little more. Yeah. Or I'd say it and I'd, be, I'd find myself going, I really needed to hear that. Yeah. And, and one of the things I say to clients sometimes is the distance from my mouth to your ears is a lot shorter than the distance from my mouth to my own ears. Yeah. And that's true for everybody. So, yeah. so thank you for letting me work with you about this because I needed to hear that. Yes. <laughs> you know? There's something about being in a constant state of learning that just feels so right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm so glad I'm able to do it in, yes. in, in this format and in just in all uh, different sorts of ways in life. Um, you had said that at Mishfest, where you found spirituality, you also found a new name for yourself. I did. What is that story <laughs> like? Well, I've always had a distinctive laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in my home community in Kalamazoo, where, where I lived the longest, um, people knew me by my laugh. They knew if I, if I was already at the party. Because they heard me laughing. Yes, and I'm so, similar. It's a, yeah. I really like it about myself, and I think I you do too. too. Yeah. yeah, and and so some of them teased me anyway, and would just call me laughing woman, um, just just teasing me, and I I got to the point where I wanted to have my own name, mm. um, and my, I was named after my mother and one of my great aunts, mm-hmm. and I just wanted my own name. Sure. Um, and so my Rosie and I were together at the time, and. And we decided we wanted our own last name, too. And so I decided I'd try on Laughing Woman. Mm-hmm. And I wore it for a year, like, you know, in, in my community. It's like, you guys just call me Laughing Woman. Let me see how it feels. Because it was a big name to grow into. It, it really was, you know. <laughs> and, and I finally was like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. So, so at the time, we lived in Allegan County, so I go out to the Allegan County Courthouse to change my name, and they're like, hmm, that's interesting. And, and the last name that we chose is Ashono Sheni, mm-hmm. and that's from a language called Laadan, which was a created language by a feminist linguist who lived in Kansas. She taught at the University of Kansas or something. She took, like, pieces of about 80 or 90 of her favorite languages and wove them together into this one language. And she did it because she feels like English is not an an emotionally rich enough language to express women's emotional reality. (laughs) So, so... (laughs) That just uh, took the wind out of me. It's, it's, It's such a beautiful poetic idea. Yes. Okay, uh-huh. sorry. Yes, yes. And so um, we took bits and pieces of other words, Rosie and I did, and, and put them together into the name Ashono Sheni, and it translates into English as family of the heart. Mm. And so um, she has since changed her name after, after we split up, mm-hmm. but I decided just to keep it. So anyway, um, that's how I changed my name, and that's the story of it. And, and I still get people who are like, now what is your first name? <laughs> <A> laughing woman. <laughs> Well, what do people call you? Yeah. Laughing woman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like you created um, something for yourself. I did. From yourself. I did. At the point that I took this name, it was my 36th birthday gift to myself. Oh. And uh, so I've carried this name now for, for 32 years. Yeah, at the time I took this this name, I was just finally out of the high drama part of my life and Mm -hmm. all of the emotional turmoil I kept in. And I decided that I really wanted a name that reminded me of the fun of life. Uh. That every time somebody said my name, I'd remember that it's supposed to be fun. (laughs) (laughs) And how have people in your life come to know you with your new name? Um, Well, most people who know me now, other than my family, Mm -hmm. have never known me with another name. Yeah. Um, Um... and, you know, I'm just like, like I am here right now. This is how I am with everybody. Yeah. This is how I am. Um, in my family, there's varying degrees of using my name. Um, some, some people do. Some people still call me my family nickname, which is just fine. I gave them permission to do that. Yeah. It's much easier for my great nieces and nephews who are still little to pronounce. You know, toddlers don't say laughing woman very easily. Sure. <laughs> um, however, however one, of my, one of my nephews, who has a, a very delightful and very sarcastic sense of humor, um, calls me Aunt Laffy Taffy. <laughs> and I love it. I was going to say, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I will be it. Aunt Laffy Taffy. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, now you kind of have me wondering, what sort of name would I pick for myself? I don't even know. Yeah. I would have to sit down and really th- th- yeah. think about some things. Uh-huh. Um, 
So now we're moving into a portion of the interview I like to call Ask a Gay Person. Okay. Um, uh, it's kind of more like an advicey thing. Um, like, for example, one question I'd, I'd love to know is, what advice would you have for people looking to get into spirituality? Uh, what I would say is put down all the books and feel yourself. Ooh. Go out into nature and notice what you notice. And then, then start reading books. Start experimenting. Start playing. Start connecting with other people as you meet them. If you're looking for an alternate spirituality, as, as instead of like the churches that are readily available, churches, synagogues, at mosques, mm-hmm. and, you know things that are, are easily recognizable in our culture, um, go to like a bookstore where they sell books about alternative spirituality. They usually have a bulletin board that's got meet and greet stuff on it, or start talking to your friends, invite people over to play. Yeah, you know. Just use your imagination, pick up a tarot deck, pick up a, you know, rune set or something like that. Start playing with it. Start learning how to use it. Connect with your friends. Read for your friends. Do things like that and and just see where it goes for you. Feel what feels right for you. Yes. Hmm. Um, What advice would you have for somebody who might be in a similar situation as you and your mother once was? And you're looking to heal a relationship. Yeah, yeah. What I would say is, first and foremost, know that you can heal it. Mm-hmm. No. Secondly, remember that your parent would have already healed it if they knew how to do it. So you're going to have to be the one who comes up with the plan. Mm. You're if they have knew how to do it. If they knew how to do it, yeah. Um, I, you know, certainly we have families that have mental illness problems, addiction problems, and stuff like that, where, where that other person is just out of reach. Mm-hmm. But in a family where you're, where that's not what you're dealing with, or with a per, a parent that that's you know they're not just gone, mm-hmm. um, reach for their heart, mm-hmm. but do it from your heart. Don't do it from guilting them. They, you don't need their apology. You need their changed behavior. Ah. So it doesn't matter if they apologize for what they did or didn't do right for you. It matters that you show up as the loving person you'd like them to be toward you, and you show them how to have a relationship with you. You show them. You show them. You you become the adult in the room. Uh, I was going to say, I don't really like this language either, but there's a little bit of a bigger person thing going on. I, um, uh, there, there's, there's a more open person thing yes. going on. That's what it is. Bigger yeah. person. I don't like that word because yeah. yeah. it's the ER. I'm yeah. more than than you. Right, right. And that's not where we're going. Yep. That's we, we, you don't want to compare yourself. You don't want to make your parent wrong. Mm-hmm. Your parent is coming from their life experience just as much as you are, and their life experience does not include the progressive world that you grew up in. Mm-hmm. They grew up 20, 30 years before you did. It was different. It was different. It also, uh, I think there's things that you, you said about interpersonal relationships that I, I, I feel like can also be applied to um, the huge political chasm that mm-hmm. we are living in. But that's also a whole different animal. It is. Some of, it's, it, is. Some of it applies and it's a whole different thing. Um, I think there's so much power in being like, I know that I can heal this. Yes. Yes. Starting from there is is, is uh, yeah. huge. It is. It is. And be patient. Be uh. patient with it. You know, it's not like I sat down and had a conver- had that hour-long conversation with my mom and then everything was hunky-dory. My mom was still my mom. Yes. It's that I insisted on continuing to play continuing to work with it, continuing to show up as the person I am rather than the person she wanted to believe I was. Oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I can say to that is, oh, my God. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. So um, something we've been doing on the show uh-huh. is we kind of wrap off, uh, wrap up rather, um, with kind of some faster questions. Sure. You know, some, it's, I, I call it the questionnaire. Yeah. But, you know, that's, the, that's such the unsexy word, <laughs> the questionnaire. 
<laughs> the but interrogation yeah, is happening yeah. now. <laughs> I am now sliding over the dossier <laughs> containing the questionnaire. <laughs> it's a quicker, sillier kind of. Yeah. So, A Star is Born, Judy Garland, Barbara Streisand, or Lady Gaga? This is hard. There's a right answer. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. I slapped the table because I got too excited. Uh, are you a movie person? Are you like Not a... really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Little House on the Prairie is more my speed. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh. My grandpa, who is 82 um, and is in the first stages of dementia, uh-huh. one thing we can still talk about <laughs> is Little, House, Little on House on the Prairie. On the prairie. Yep. <laughs> Um, what do you see as the biggest difference between younger folks, uh, younger LGBTQ folks and older LGBTQ folks? Um, they're not carrying the baggage that the older ones are. Yes. They didn't have to come through the depth of oppression we did. Um, that's it. Yeah. That's it. And, you know, and social media. They've got, they've got ways to connect that we didn't. Mm. They can connect at much younger ages than we did. For better and for worse. Yes. Uh, oh, we kind of talked about that. What do you feel about younger people using the word queer? Um, I'm not in favor of me using the word queer because queer was derogatory yes. when when I was younger. Um, I think that young people using that is, it's a way of claiming power over the word, which is exactly what gay and lesbian people did. You know, we lesbian, lesbian was... A bad thing. Uh-huh. Dyke was a worser thing. Ah! So Dyke was the word. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were all dykes for quite some time, you know? And um, and so I, I'm like, I don't particularly enjoy being labeled queer, mm-hmm. um, but I absolutely totally celebrate the younger generations going, I'm queer. Yeah. Like, yes. And uh, what does queer mean? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that's not like what you think it should be. <laughs> that question is not on the questionnaire because I don't think I can answer it myself. Uh-huh. Uh, what you're saying is not for me. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm saying, and I'll celebrate it with you. Uh, I'm not just saying I'll accept it. I'm saying you deserve celebration and I'm going to celebrate that you do that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I could go on and on about like the fallacy of acceptance and tolerance. Uh, yes. I don't want, nobody wants to be tolerated. No. Nobody wants to be just accepted. No, no. You know, that's, we accept bad gifts on Christmas. Right. I'm a person. Um, have you ever used a dating site or app? No. Um, what is your best Halloween costume? Um, I was dressed all in black had my face painted in blue and silver and gold and was totally recognizable to everybody at the party. But because of my costume, I gave myself permission to be a total slut. Oh, uh, that's what Halloween's for. <laughs> it is. <laughs> they, they, they say the, the, the door between the living and dead is the thinnest. Oh, yes. It's also the door between yes. slut and the, not the, slut the is the thinnest. The proper and the really bad. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and I reached through that door. <laughs> but what were you? Were you were you Starry Night? No, I was just like it appealed just, to me. Yes, I, I was just whatever I whatever anybody saw me as. <laughs> you were feeding the fantasy. Uh huh. Um, what would you bring to a potluck dinner? I would bring cannelloni or Irish shortbread. Ooh, Irish shortbread. Homemade. Irish shortbread. Yes. Uh, tell. Okay, wait. <laughs> all all it is is <laughs> butter. It is butter, it is sugar, and it is white flour. Totally, totally bad for cholesterol. Totally delightful for the taste buds. <laughs> Absolute I, indulgence, and I make it on a regular basis. <laughs> carbs, sweet, fat. Yeah. And Let's it has see. to be real butter. I was going to ask, because me and my sister kind of had a conversation, and she was like, why would you waste Good, expensive butter in baking. Because margarine tastes like crap. Oh, margarine. I the am butter, the anti-margarine The butter warrior. has a richness to it in this shortbread. Oh, yeah. That I, I ate some one, one time that somebody uh, made with restaurant butter, which was half butter, half shortening. Okay. Oh, it was awful. Ah. It was not my recipe, even though they thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in a butter-only household. Uh-huh. Um, and it shows. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, there's so many good ones, but I want to be fast. Um, 
you get to have dinner with three people dead or alive. Who are they? Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Hmm. Marie Antoinette. Nice. Um. Hmm. I'd have to name like 40 others. I know. Yeah. That's unfair. That's an unfair question. Yeah, yeah. Marie Antoinette would definitely be at the table. Probably Lucretia Borgia, Borgia too. Oh, you don't <laughs> have a dinner with her. She's going she's gonna to poison you. Um, <laughs> Not if I get her first. <laughs> oh. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, what makes you happy? Oh, the earth, ah. the sunshine, my cats. How many cats do you have? Two. Jacunga and Da Vinci. <laughs> and are they, uh, have you, did you get them recently? Are they older cats? Are they younger um, cats? Jacunga is about seven years old. Da Vinci is about two years old. Oh. Yes. And they're, they're both boys, which is my favorite cats. Yes. Female cats aren't near as baby as boy cats say. They're just cuddlers all their lives. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My boyfriend's <laughs> mom was going to be a cat breeder. Uh-huh. So there's just a lot there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what gives you hope? The future. The Ooh. future. I, I look at I look at at like Gen Z right now, mm -hmm. and they are such a an outspoken, determined, chaotic, hot mess. Yes. And they are so amazingly beautiful and inspiring all at the same time, and their determination gives me hope me too mm -hmm. i think gen z has this thing down that's really incredible which is they're like yeah i don't really care about that yeah it's like whoa yeah or like uh that's messed up so i don't really invest my time in that because the whole system's stupid yeah it's like, oh it's so refreshing yes yes um what is the best age Either two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or anything beyond 40. Uh, um, mm -hmm. I would have to say that for me, life up to the age of 40 um, was peaks and valleys. Amazing, amazing things. Incredible stuff, particularly in my 20s and 30s. Um, but, but there was always a crash point for me emotionally. Mm-hmm. When I got into my 40s, I was just like, you know what? I am over it. Yeah. My bullshit meter is up to here. Yeah. And I'm not doing it anymore. Yep. And and it started with my own bullshit. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I've had enough of that. I am so over it. Mm -hmm. well, let me take care of my own beeswax. And yes. Then. Yes. Um, you have been very kind in letting me ask you just about any question about your personal life and about just about <laughs> anything. If you had a question for me, what would it be? What inspires you about being a gay man? Ah, uh, um, I feel so lucky to be gay. And it, it, it's kind of, um, I never, and this is a really a credit to how I grew up and the people I grew up around. I never didn't have the choice to be the um, creative person I am, the loud person that I am how I see the world, my perspective. I was supported in a way where I was able to just be who I was. And I, I kind of, I really dig who I am uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> to, to some extent on a good day. Uh -huh. So we'll take today. We might even say the word love like uh -huh. you did earlier. We uh -huh. might, we might even, um, but I just love that I get to be my weird little self. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I hope the other people get that ex get to get to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so much fun. Yes. And being a gay man and being around other queer people, we're funny. Oh, we are hilarious. I love our community. I love us. <laughs> the we're colorful. We're weird. We're loud. We're, we love to play. Yes. <laughs> uh, think about how many people lose the love to play. I know. Yes. I know. Um, yeah. And I also love that we are so, I, I don't like the word intelligent, I like the word smart, but we can be so intellectual, but also so stupid. Yes. 
Ah, I love that dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yes, I want to thank you so much for coming here today and, and meeting you in person has been so wonderful. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you and um, thank you for being on the show and sharing yeah. yourself with us. Well, and thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. This has been a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> For more podcasts like this one, visit aadl.org slash podcasts. And if you or someone you know would be interested in being a guest on our show, email us at thegayestgeneration at aadl.org.